Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Central Church of Christ. We're really glad to have you here with us. It's a special day today because today is Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to all of you. And we just want to uh, hopefully honor our mothers today during the service. Um, if, if you know, or if, if you are a mother, if you're a woman and you're a member of Central, you should have received a cookie in the past three days. We had lots of people out making deliveries at all of your doors. If for some reason you did not receive that cookie, please let us know. We have a number there. It's 828-851-1344. We want to know so that we can make sure we get a cookie to you. So please call us or text us and let us know that you did not receive one. We'll make sure we correct that uh, as soon as possible this coming week. Also, I want to let you know about what's coming next week. Next week is our graduation Sunday. We're still not meeting live at the building, but we're going to honor our high school graduates by playing a video at 10 a.m. Uh, during the worship service. It'll be the slideshow with all their baby pictures and everything, so you want to make sure you tune in for that. Also, in connection with that, I want to just ask if any of you know of any college graduates. We're still trying to track down all of our college grads who are connected to Central. Um, if, if you are a family member of a college grad and you would like them to be recognized, please send us a picture and information about where they're graduating from, what their degree is, and maybe uh, a little sentence about their future plans as well. If you can get that to me or to somebody from on staff, we'll make sure we include them in the graduation ceremony next week. So today's sermon and devotional is about encouraging moms, and of course that's very timely because of Mother's Day, so uh, we look forward to hearing what Ernie has to say about that. With all that said, I believe we're going to go right into our time of prayer now, so let's pray and we'll get into worship. God, we just come before you now, we thank you so much for another Sunday, another day to be together to worship you, uh, and God... We know that you are the only one that's worthy of that worship, and so uh, we're happy to be here. We're, we're overjoyed to just spend some time reflecting on you and, and being in your presence together today. And God, uh, we certainly are thankful for our mothers and uh, for all the women in our lives who have blessed us and taken care of us in so many different ways and who just love us the way that only a mother can. And so thank you for that blessing, uh, God. Um, I pray that this day will be a huge blessing to all those women and that, uh, that all of us who are not mothers can make sure that we go out of our way to, to make this day a blessing. Right now, God, we want to just spend our time focusing on you. And uh, so we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, the call, today, the call to worship today comes from 1 Samuel 2. 2. And before I read it, uh, I just want to make a little note to you. I don't know what your service is like in your homes, but in my home, sometimes worship service can be a little bit distracting, and the singing can kind of be a little awkward, because there's only five of us in my home, and uh, so I want to give you a little pro tip here, a little tip for how you can sing along and worship God with all your heart without feeling that awkwardness of being, you know, only a few people in the room. Hey, take that volume, turn it right up, as loud as you need to turn it up, and then you can sing along with the people that are on the TV, and you can sing as loud as you want, and just cry out to God, and that'll be, you know, you won't even hear yourself if you turn it up loud enough. So you can adjust the volume however you want for that. But let's get into our call to worship. It's 1 Samuel 2, verse 2. This is during the prayer of Hannah, and all the verses we're going to be reading leading up to Ernie's sermon will be from the, the song that Hannah sang, the prayer that she prayed um, to God because he made her a mother. So this is 1 Samuel 2, 2. If you will read it with me. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. And that is exactly what we believe, and that's exactly why we're here, and it's exactly why we worship Him. Let's do that now. There's a stirring deep within me, could it be my time has come? When I see my gracious Savior, face to face when all is done, is that His voice I am hearing, come away my precious one, is He calling me?
of stirring deep within me. Could it be my time has come? When I see my gracious Savior face to face when all is done, is that his voice I am hearing? Come away, my precious one. Is he calling me? Tells me I 
Hannah's prayer is a beautiful prayer, but there's this one section in 1 Samuel 2, verse 6 that's really fascinating to me. It says, The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down the grave and raises it up. Now, Hannah was referring to God's sovereignty and just how He is over everything. He's over life and death. But what she didn't know, and what so many people in the Old Testament didn't know when they spoke, was she was also talking about Jesus. She was talking about God's power over the grave and how one day he would demonstrate that power through his son. You see, Hannah, she was blessed by God with a son. And many years later, God blessed this entire world with his own son. Let's, uh, let's pray about that now. God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for blessing this world with your son. God, thank you for not just blessing us with his life and his words and uh, his actions to demonstrate to us how we can live, but then uh, you, you blessed us in a, in a roundabout way. It was not something that we are proud of or happy about in the sense that he had to die, uh, but... Oh, we're so blessed that he willingly did. And that you blessed us by raising him from the dead. God, thank you for that. Thank you for his body that was broken for us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's continue our prayer. God, again, thank you so much for the blood of Jesus that was shed for us to cleanse us of our sins so that we could be with you forever. And it's in his name we pray again. Amen.
In 1 Samuel 2, verse 1, she says, My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. I rejoice because you rescued me. And he rescued her by granting her Samuel, her son. Um, again, I want to wish all of you a happy Mother's Day. And moms, uh, you, you know what this prayer is all about if you've been blessed with a child. Uh, you know how precious those babies are. And um, God truly has given us all, those of us who have children, it's a gift. Children are a gift from God. Uh, and God has given us lots of gifts. Um, for me, the children are probably one of the greatest gifts he's given me. But right now is a chance for us to just thank God for all the many things he's blessed us with, all the ways he has gifted us, and, uh, and just to give back a little bit. So uh, as we prepare to give thanks to God and, and give back a little, let's pray. God, we're just so grateful for the many children that, that uh, so many Sundays we get to see running around this building. And uh, we look forward to the time where we get to see those uh, sweet faces again as they uh, sometimes run a little bit too much around the building and we have to tell them to slow down. But they're such a blessing anyways, God, and thank you for that. And thank you for the many ways that you bless us, God, uh, through family, through uh, finances, just provision uh, through relationships. God, you just bless us in so many wonderful ways. And so we thank you for all of those. And we pray that uh, this gift that we give back to you today will, will be uh, used to bless so many other people in your name. Um, it's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, good morning to you from Central and from Michael Morton, who's here doing all the video work for us uh, today for J.D. Uh, Morris, and he's been leading us in our worship, and together, uh, we are together, even though we're not in the same building. So good morning to you. This is our time of prayer and scripture. If you have a prayer request, you'd like to go to the entire Central family and our prayer teams, send an email prayer request to prayer at SpartanburgChurch.org. Now here's something new. If you'd like to communicate just with our elders and would like to use email to do that, there's a new email set up that will go only to the church elders here at Central. Email whatever you have to say to elders at SpartanburgChurch.org and they'll monitor that very, very closely. Well, our prayer list has been the same and as things change, as we go through this season, uh, no doubt there are new people we'd like to add on to the list. Maybe you have other people on your minds. We've got that anyone or anything else category. We've got the prayers for protection and for peace and for patience and for kindness and for uh, humility there and for courage, for healing and for cure and for prevention. All of those things are here. And then especially today, we want to also pray for mothers and for all women, because um, we are truly blessed in the church. The church could not function without women in it, could not function without the mothers in it. And many women are mothers, and all women are important to the church, and they're important to God. So much so that our scripture reading today is a prayer of a woman. And I don't know what you would think. What would a woman pray and it is after all the events, the very famous events in Hannah's life, that she prayed this prayer, read along with me. Then Hannah prayed, My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Now I have an answer for my enemies. I rejoice because you rescued me. No one is holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. And then notice a pattern of reversal about which she prays. The bow of the mighty is now broken, and those who stumble are now strong. Those who were well fed are now starving, and those who were starving are now full. The childless woman now has seven children, and the woman with many children wastes away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave 
and raises up. For all the earth is the Lord's, and he has set the world in order. He will protect his faith once, but the wicked will disappear in darkness. He will succeed. No one will succeed by strength alone. But God will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. And so, Father, we do pray in all these things that we would not try to accomplish any of the desires of our hearts in our own strength, but through your strength, and that you would exalt us because we bear the name of your son, Jesus, to do your work here. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so, Encouraging Moms is a sermon title, and I just want to be kind of behind the curtains, a little revealing here. This is a change of plans for me. It was just last, this past February, just a few months ago, when I was charting out some sermons, this one came up. And, and my plan for what we would have done on this day, well, let me just say, it was to encourage moms with a very building-focused effort. And so I wanted to, to encourage all moms, because we have moms in our central family in all the seasons of motherhoods. We have multiple generations of moms, but not just moms. We have multiple generations of women that are vital in the life of the central church family. And so we're going to talk about each one and find uh, people at different, women at different seasons of life in the Bible, talk about them and then pray for each one. That was the plan. We were going to do that here. And then as women were leaving the day, all females, anyone old enough to eat a cookie, <laughs> we're going to get a cookie. And those are really good cookies, I've heard. That was the plan. Well, we all know what happened. I mean, we wanted to honor all females here at the building, but we had to do some things different because the plans have changed. I mean, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, people showed up at your house with gloves and masks. <laughs> so that wasn't in the original plans. Peggy and I got to deliver about 10 uh, families, cookies, and it was, it was a delight to get to see the ones that you did. And I heard similar reports from the others that helped deliver that. And a special word of thanks to Debbie Fallon. She did all that organizing, and it was quite the task. But again, it wasn't what we had hoped to do today. And so again, let me say, if, if you're a female, we want you to get one of those wonderful Cheryl's cookies. If you didn't get one, call or text that number, and we will try to get that to you, if the Lord wills, this next week. But so we come to a Mother's Day unlike any in my lifetime. And so maybe let me be the first to wish you a happy Mother's Day from at least six feet away. We are physically diff uh, distant. I don't think we're socially different. We're distant. We're still connected together. But is a change of plans a bad thing? Not always. I tried to find who originally said this. I've heard this for years. If you can't change your plans, you can't change your life. I couldn't find who originally said it, but I think there's some truth in it. And one reason I know there is, is today's lesson is someone who does that, who makes a single change of plan, and it changes her entire trajectory of life, her entire destiny. And the one we're talking about is Hannah. And she's really the focus of the first two chapters of 1 Samuel. Well, now, rather than looking at different seasons of females' lives or moms' lives, let's look at three seasons of Hannah's life. And just so you, if you're keeping up, the first season takes the longest to talk about, at least in today's sermon. But you got some fill in the blanks. The seasons of Hannah's life. Here's season one of Hannah's life. Just write the word empty. She is empty empty in her life. Let me read to you beginning in verse 3 of chapter 1. Year after year, Elkanah, that's Hannah's husband, went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat, the celebratory or the festival meal to his wife. Wait a minute, that's not Hannah. Yeah, this is one of those one man, two wives story. Uh, Panina, 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 I think is her name. And notice she's got all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah, yeah, she's his wife too. He gave a double portion because he loved her in the Lord. 
had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival, yeah, Peninnah, kept provoking Hannah in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her. So on the day that should be the happiest, all she could do was weep. And the day with perhaps the greatest meal of the year, she couldn't even eat. She would not eat. Now, her husband is sympathetic and concerned. And I think it's commendable because he he would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? And and he wanted to try to comfort her, and he he said this, Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? But she's in deep anguish. In her deep anguish, Hannah was weeping bitterly. So let's look at this emptiness in this woman. And in the original Hebrew, uh, the words translated deep anguish, profound anguish pain at the level of the soul. She's hurting soul deep, so much so that it spills out with loud crying, wailing aloud. This is a woman who is in absolute misery in every part of her being. Why? I've thought of three reasons, and reason number one, I think, is the big one in the room, the elephant, She's in a polygamous marriage. Now, this bears mentioning because there are people who don't think like we do about the Bible. We think the Bible is perfect. That God has given us His perfect Word and that it is absolutely the authority of our lives and of our faith and of our church. But people will say, well, you can't believe the Bible because it will recommend things we know that's not right. And you go, well, like what? Well, they'll say like polygamy. The Bible is all okay with polygamy and it's stories like this. All right, this comes along, and it's, I mentioned it a few weeks ago, but it bears repeating. What the Bible describes is always accurate, but it's not always what the Bible prescribes. This is a polygamous marriage. It doesn't mean God is okay with it. From Genesis, it's one man, one woman. That's what marriage is in God's eyes. So that's one thing, but here's another thing, and you can check me out on this. In the Bible, without exception, everyone in a polygamous marriage is totally miserable. Take uh, Penina, for example. She's so miserable, she has to hound her rival, to provoke her rival, to make her so upset she's crying and won't eat. And then, of course, you've got a woman who can't eat, and all she can do is cry. It's just misery. That's what happens when people go against God's plan. Here's the second one. Hannah, through no fault of her own, cannot live up to the cultural idea. And what I mean by that is what her culture said was how you found joy and happiness and meaning and significance. Because in that ancient Jewish culture, if you're a woman, here's how you prove your worth. Here's how you found fulfillment. Here's how you got happy. You had children. You had lots of children like Panana, she has lots of children. You can go, man, what a backwards culture. No, it's really very practical. There's an economic, a military, and a long-term benefit for that. Think about it. The more children you have, the more children that can work the field. So you, you bring in more crops. Or if you've got a family business, the more children that can work in the family business. And then if you've got a military, the more kids you have, the more sons you have, then the bigger your army is. And some pipsqueak country can't come and knock you off and take you into slavery because you've got way too big an army for them. And then who's going to take care of mom after Dad dies. I mean, forever women have outlived men. Well, it would, would, would be children who would do it. So it's very, very practical. And look, every culture does this. Every culture, sometimes subtly, usually overtly says, you want to be happy, you want to be fulfilled, you want to be valuable. Here's what you do. What is it in our culture? Let's say you're a female. Be beautiful. Be smart. Get a successful career. Get married. Have children. You know, be artistic. Whatever. The, the culture is saying, these are the people we applaud. These are the people who are really, really worth something. And then the third part of the emptiness is people will harass you when you don't measure up. It's certainly going on in Hannah's life. She is judged by people who seem to be living out that ideal. The Bible uses the word rival. And of course, it's natural. 
You have two women married to the same man. It's a natural rival. And continually, year after year, there is this provoking, making, just making fun of her. You don't have children. You're not worth anything. And then there's her husband. And I want to defend this guy, not on the multiple marriage thing, but on his effort to comfort his wife. He's trying to be understanding to his wife. His comments are well-intentioned, and he does love this woman. I mean, he says to her, I love you, which has to mean the only way that would be a comfort to her is I've got this other wife, and she gives me children, but, but I love you at least more than I love her. Maybe I don't even love her. I just have children with her, but I love you. And, and the notion about am I not worth more than, than, than 10 sons to you Well, that's well-intentioned, but I think it just adds pressure because there's always, back then, now, and as long as there are humans in society, there's going to be the pressure to fit in. If you're going to be somebody, you've got to do what the culture says. And in that day, it was get married, if you're a woman, and have children. And there's all those pressures uh, around today. There is no such thing as a non-oppressive culture. All cultures try to shape us into the mold of what they value. And you bring that dynamic to a day like today, Mother's Day, it makes Mother's Day the greatest blessing. And it makes it a big time curse. I mean, which is it? And the answer is yes, it's both. I mean, just some of the things in this story alone get to some of the deepest pains that exist. Barrenness. And I'm not a female, but I'm a little bit experienced in this Peggy and I were married well over 10 years before uh, we thought we might be having a child, and it still took forever. And we, ended, you know, we, I don't want to say ended up because we were blessed to be able to adopt. But there came a point in time where I really, really wanted to be a dad. I had, you know, nephews and nieces. I had lots of kids that were friends at church and things like that. I, but I wanted, we wanted our own child, and so I, I would, I've used this illustration before, but just to compare. I really wanted to have a child, and I was really blessed to have a great one, all right? But my desire to have a child, and I was like, whatever it takes, we're going to have a child, it would be like comparing a drop of dew on the end of a blade of grass to all the water and all the oceans and all the seas and all the lakes and all the rivers and all the streams and all the springs in the world, that was how much my wife wanted to have a child. Okay? I really did. And she really did. And that's because God wired most women to want to be mothers. And so if that's not happened for you, well, it's, it's impossible for me, I think, to describe adequately the pain, but then, but then there's the joy <laughs> when you do have children. I mean, just the delight of having those little kids that look up to you and think you're the world, that run to you and hug you and, and kiss you and draw funny pictures for you that you put on your refrigerator and you see them grow and, and get accomplish things. And I mean, it's just one of, the, I think one of the great things in life is the joy in having children. And that's maybe why some of the greatest despair is caused by children. More than one occasion, Sometimes couples, but many times just females over the years, and always done appropriately, we're very careful about that here at Central. We have windows on the doors, and we keep doors open, but women have come to the office, and their just hearts are just crushed. And, and many times it's over their children, many times adult children who are making terrible, terrible choices. So it's, it's a blessing, it's a curse. And, and then there, there's just the, the, let's just call it the brevity of it. You know, the sunrise, sunset of it from Fiddler, right? Fiddler on the roof. Sunrise, sunset, sunrise, sunset. Swiftly flow the days. Seedlings turn overnight to sunflowers. Blossoming even as we gaze. It's so much truth. I mean, the Bible says your life is what? A vapor. Well, my whole life's a vapor. What's the time with children? It's just a hint of a breath, and, and then it's gone. And there's nothing more potent in a child's life than the presence of a mother. Potent for good, powerful for good. And there may be no more powerful negative thing than the absence of a mom. It may be seen in someone that's 
absolutely adored by our culture. You know, I don't like her politics, but I want to tell you, I was very blessed. I was a senior in college. Uh, our college uh, band and orchestra we were in Atlanta, and we, we had Saturday Night Free, and she was there, and we were able to get tickets. 25 bucks, it was huge money back then. Two rows from the back, Atlantic Civic Center, and I saw Barbra Streisand. I want to tell you, I've been blessed to see a lot of concerts, a lot of performers. Nobody, and I mean nobody, has the charisma she has on stage. She's electric. And everybody, and whether you like her politics or not, I don't particularly agree with them, but just, just the performing ability and the gifts and the talents, which is, is really ironic. In, in her biography, James Spada, Streisand, Her Life, Streisand tells them, she said, I had you know, a very strained relationship with my own mother. In fact, mother never told me she loved me. And so for years, Streisand wouldn't perform live. She had stage fright, if you can believe it. But then she decided to go on a concert tour back in 2006, I think it was. And it was the biggest hit of the year. Getting Streisand tickets was just a real accomplishment. People played huge money to see her. I think she did 10 or 12 or 15 concerts. Well, anyway, the last concert, and it was in 2006, and people thought this will be the last time, because that's the way it was built, we'll ever see Streisand perform in public. And when she walked on stage, uh, Spada says there's 15 minutes of standing ovation before the first note is played, before she could even sing or even speak of yelling and screaming, adulation, stomping their feet. They're so enamored with her. And finally she says, stop, stop. We've got to do the concert. We've got to do the concert. But before she sang, she walked off stage. The lights followed her. There was a lady there, an older lady in a wheelchair. And after all that adulation, Streisand said these words to her mother. You're proud of me now, Mama? I mean, there's so much pressure for women to, you know, be power women to do everything, to be super moms, and, and you try and you do magnificent jobs, but if you keep trying, you are going to crash, and there's going to be a void, and the question is, with that void in your life, how are you going to fill it? Where are you going to find your value? Well... I've got a movie, a little short one for us to watch that talks about what makes something or someone valuable. Watch this movie. Hey guys, who wants $20? Me! Really? Yeah. You just want me to hand you the $20 I gave? Yeah. Um, what if I do this? Now, who wants my $20 now? Me. Seriously? Yeah. But it's all crumbled up. Yeah. Okay, alright, alright, I got it. Ready? What if I do this? Yeah. Who wants my twenty dollars now? Yeah. Alright. Here, I'll give you twenty dollars, and I'll give you twenty dollars, and I'll give you twenty dollars. <laughs> you have anything to say to me? Thank you! You're welcome. We were able to get those Hollywood actors to do that. Do you get the point? It doesn't matter what happens to that $20 bill. It's still worth what? $20. And here's the thing, folks. You have great intrinsic built into you by your builder value. No matter what you have or haven't accomplished or experienced. You could have zero children. You could have a thousand children. It doesn't matter. You have intrinsically great value. No matter which people notice you, no matter which people ignore you or abandon you. If your mother never talked to you, you still have great value. No matter what you have or haven't done. And I'm talking morality here. I mean, you could have obeyed and been faithful to the best of your God-given ability all your life. Or you could have really fallen short of the glory of God and slipped up and done a lot of things that are evil. It doesn't matter. You still have great value. It doesn't matter what anyone has done to you. And no matter what they said about you, you have great value. And no matter how much all of that hurts you, how much pain or misery or emptiness you have. I mean, even if life has crumbled you up and thrown you on the floor and stumped you like J.D. did that $20 bill, it didn't change the value. You have great value no matter what. Do you understand that? Because your Creator made you valuable. But there's a warning. 
there's a lot of other things that culture throws out. And it's not like totally real and totally fake like the money is. There's some good in those things. But to give you your ultimate worth, they're phony. And yet the culture pushes them. And for all her life, Hannah hasn't found what she's looking for. So she's empty, which leads to season season two. And this is good news. Her life is filled. Why? Because she changes one thing, one aspect of her life plan, and it changes the direction of her life. Oh, so much for the good. So once they, her family, had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now you got to wonder why that line, as mundane as it is, was included in Holy Scripture by the Holy Spirit. Now, Eli is the priest, and he was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house, the tabernacle. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she makes a vow, and I want you to notice it's an if-then vow, a conditional vow to the Lord. It's if-then. Lord Almighty, she says, if. You will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son. Then, and here's the payoff, I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. And if you remember our study of Samson, that means she's going to have him take the Nazarite vow, no cutting of the hair, no drinking of the wine. She's going to take him. He's going to serve in the house of the Lord all his life, which means what? Is she giving up? Well, he's not going to be there to work in the family business. And when she gets old, this child, if she gets one, is not going to be her long-term care guarantee. She's giving up everything. And she kept on praying to the Lord. Eli, the priest, observed her mouth. Notice that. Hannah was praying in her heart, like you do perhaps. But her lips were moving. Many of us do that. But her voice was not heard. Now, Eli thought she was drunk. And he said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? And if he was correct in what he thought was going on, he gives some pretty sound advice. He says, put away your wine. But let me ask you, this is a word to the church and to Christians, okay? What did Eli do? He looked at the situation, looked at her, read the signs and the clues, but misjudged, misjudged what was going on. And we all do it. In fact, not only do we misjudge, we've had experiences before. And the reason he thought that is he must have seen people like that before. And that's called prejudge. And we all do it. We've got to be careful about it. But here's the thing. We can let a misjudge and a prejudge become permanent. And no matter what else comes our way, no matter what data, what facts, what information, that you know what happens? That when you fix prejudging, it becomes prejudice. And we can't see truth because we have a slant on things. Now, what's the cure for us being prejudiced and not being able to help people in the name of the Lord? It is to listen. And that's exactly what this man of God does. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief to which Eli said, go in peace and get this word, may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. Now, what do we call this that he did? He did what every one of us should do when we had interaction with people, especially if we maybe first misjudged somebody. Anytime we're communicating with anybody, we should point them to God. And when he does that, what does he give her? He gives her this greatest of gifts. He gives hope. But please note, he says, May. I'm going to pray with you. He doesn't say, I've heard from the Lord. This time next year, you're going to have a baby. Others have that in the Old Testament. He's just saying, I'm going to pray with you. And, and that makes her respond positively to him. Great lesson for the church there. Point people to God. Give hope. May your servant find favor in your eyes. And then, and this is amazing to me. Hannah went away, ate something, and her face was no longer 
down cat. So here's, here's her fullness. I mean, she ate something. Previously, she'd been so upset, so grief-stricken, stricken, she couldn't eat a thing. And her face was no longer downcast, which means her deep anguish was gone. Her bitter weeping had stopped. And I just got one question. What happened? What made her stop? What changed her worldview? Let her stop crying. Let her stop beating. You said, it's easy, Ernie. She got her baby. No. No. I mean, she's just had this total reversal. Let me just read some more of the text. What happens the very next morning? So here's one day. They go to worship. They worship the Lord. And then they take time to travel back to their home. That's at least some days. And then there's some time for some family time. And then at some point in time, the Lord uh, remembers her. And then in the course of time, Hannah becomes pregnant. And then, and I think I know how long this is. I think it's nine months. Then she gives birth. We got at least a year, maybe more. All right. Here's How the fullness comes is things she didn't do and something she did. What did she not do? She didn't listen to that first voice. The voice of her rival, the voice of the culture. The voice of the rival saying, you are worthless and the only way you're going to be valuable and happy is you must have children. By the way, our culture says things like that. You need to get married. You need to have children. You need to have a career. Whatever it is, that's where you're going to find fulfillment. Okay, she is being told you must Find your ultimate worth in your children. And she is not going to listen to that first voice. But she also doesn't listen to the second voice, who's not her rival, but her dearly loved husband. I mean, he says, don't I mean more to you than ten sons? And it's wonderful to have a great marriage relationship. But what she's not going to do is to find her ultimate worth in her marriage. Nor should we. As great as marriage is, we must not find our identity as someone's wife, someone's husband, because somebody's going to die, right? Or something's going to happen, and you just, just just not able to stand up. So what does she do? Here's what she did. She stood up. That seemingly mundane line. Oh, that's why you read the big old commentaries. They know things like this. That's a Hebrew language figure speech, meaning she made a decision. She took a stand. She changed her path. Maybe the closest we have in English is she put her foot down and then she started picking her foot up going in another direction. She stood up and said, I'm not going down this path any longer. I'm not going to listen to the culture that says my meaning will come from having children. She's not going to listen to her critics. We're saying you are worthless because you don't have children. She's not going to let children become her idol, her life her everything, nor will she let her husband become her idol, her life, her everything. And then she does the second thing. She does something radical. She prays. She prays out of the depth of her soul. Pain, through her pain and her tears, she pours out her heart, her soul to the Lord saying this, I've tried to find my value other places, but now I will find my value my worth, my fulfillment, my happiness from no one but you, God. You say, how do you know that? She made an if-then pledge. I mean, this is all about getting the kid, right? Okay, you just heard the timeline. If it's all about the payoff of a child, then the process would go in this order. Prayer, vow, pregnancy, and then peace. Is that what we just read? No, there's at least a year before, between when she got happy and started eating but, and the pregnancy. No, so here is indeed the timeline. Here is indeed the order. Prayer and a vow. And then let's add in a little bit of encouragement from a man of God. So that's what the Christian should do. That's what the church should do. But she's making the decision. And then peace right then. She got up, ate. Her face was no longer downcast. And then I guess at least a year later, pregnancy, but she found the peace long before the pregnancy, which really means if it comes, I'll I'll accept it. I'll be delighted, but I'm getting my joy from you. And it's just like what Jesus taught. Don't we come to prayer knowing our heavenly father already knows what we need. I mean, even before we ask him, even before we're aware of the need that knowing that God knows our needs 
frees us to seek first what this woman is seeking, a relationship with God first. The kingdom of God first. Living in a relationship that's right with God first. And then just trusting Him. He'll give us everything else that He knows that we need. Uh, Needless to say, I'm not a female, but I can read some very wise ones like Angela Thomas, best-selling female Christian author. I just say female because what she's going to talk about in her best-selling book, Don't You Know Who I Am? and Other Brave Questions Women Ask. She talks about trying to fill that void. Here's what she says. Mothering requires everything, but eventually everything given plus little replenished equals desperately empty. So what are you going to do? She said, I held out the empty cup of my soul to my husband and I begged him to fill it. Then I held it out to a bigger house and to a new van, but they could not fill my soul. I tried my children. I tried my girlfriends, but again, they could not fill that place. The void designed by God for Himself that only Jesus can fill. And by the way, that's true male, female, married, single, mom, not mom. It's true for all of us. You see this woman changed. I will take my value from how God sees me and trust Him. And it changes the trajectory of her life from misery to peace and even to happiness, which frees her to come to, I guess we got to call this the bittersweet portion of her life, poured out. Let's read the end of the story. Hannah said to her husband, Elkanah, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord and he will live there always. She's going to keep her vow. And it's just like, can you imagine giving up a child right after the child is weaned? Because that's pretty young. I know that different experts say different amount, but it's, it's a different age, but it's very young. Now, I know that the Kids and Kids Central, this is one of the answers to your question. Again, this is why we have those wonderful Hebrew scholars we reference and read. In, in their culture, weaning was more than just strict weaning. It's where the child can function and maybe help the home. Think, I mean, what really good would it do for a child to be in the tabernacle of the child is, you know, you know, two years a toddler, right? Three years, right? You know, and that wouldn't do any good. So the scholars say somewhere between six and eight years. Does that make it any easier? No, that makes it worse in my opinion. But that's the story. And she's going to keep her vow. And, and she does. They brought the boy to Eli and she said to him, remember me? Pardon me, my Lord. As surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here Besides you praying, I pray for this child, and the Lord had granted me what I ask of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord. And he, and I think that he is the child, worshiped the Lord. They are some just lessons. Hannah teaches all of us we aren't really filled up until we can let go. And that just means we're not being filled up by the only one that can really fill us, namely Jesus. You know, my cup overflows like David would say. And if we aren't willing to pour back out, we never got filled in the first place. I mean, the reason we can't let go is we've placed too much on whatever that relationship is. We can only be filled by God. All of that to say, the goal of parenting is to raise your children to know the Lord, to know Jesus as Savior, as Redeemer, as Master, as Friend, as the one who will take us into eternity, the one we live for, to know Him in that relationship. And it's a big so that you as a parent, you as a mom, us as dads, can release them in the Lord. And moms, you do incredible work pouring into your children a faith in God and Jesus so that you can let them go uh, in the Lord. And to encourage moms today, there's a, I've got a commercial from a couple of years ago that a company did preceding the Winter Olympics. And it shows moms working with these from the very youngest age that will grow up to be Olympic athletes. But I want you to look at how hard, how dedicated the moms are, how hard they work. And then translate that to what is the ultimate goal, the only goal that matters, that our children know and love God and love and follow Jesus. So 
be encouraged by this commercial movie here. You can just see the emotion. The Apostle John, the disciple of Jesus' love, would write when he was very old, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. To, to have a child, to, to get married, to have a, a close friend is to give your heart away and allow them to fill it up or to squish it flat. Moms, dads, Bringing your children to faith and letting them go in faith, that's the gold medal. And there is not a close second. We believe in free will. Children make their own choices when they grow up, right? But I'm just asking now, humbly, as a dad who's made a lot of mistakes and seen a lot of parents do a really good job on this too, and just I'm always encouraged when good things happen in our son's lives. But is it your own? ultimate goal is that in which you invest the most their spiritual health loving God loving Jesus and therefore following God and Jesus all into eternity and loving people with the love of Jesus all the way that's the gold medal now do you know the baby's name <laughs> this is Samuel <laughs> he's the guy that led the transition of Israel from the judges to the kings he anointed the kings he's one of the most important men who ever lived and he's as great as he is because Hannah gave him up to the Lord, poured him out, poured out her heart, and God filled him up and used him mightily. But you know, Hannah wasn't the only one to give up a son, to pour out a son. I, I doubt she knew that she had any prophetic word when she was praying about the sovereignty of God, like J.D. talked about at communion. But when she said, the Lord brings death and makes alive, he brings down to the grave and, and raises up. It was talking about Jesus, talking about God's Son. And because God's Son died and was raised, you and I, though we die, yet will we live again in Jesus Christ. I mean, from the, the, the cradle to the cross to the grave to the sky, He is exalted and He brings many sons and daughters to glory. I mean, God so loved the world, He gave up His Son. And Jesus so loved us, he, he gave His blood, He poured out His blood as a sacrifice to give the sins of many. And I want to tell you, today's service may have been different than I planned, but that is absolutely not a change of plans for God. The sacrifice of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and us being forgiven because of that, 
has always been God's plan. And that word world is all the people in the world. And that word world means you. This is how much God loves you. He gave up His Son. And how much Jesus loves you. He poured out His blood. And that's why you have great value. Father, I thank You that You gave us Your Son. I thank You that, Jesus, You poured out Your blood to forgive us of our sins. I thank You, God, that You raised Jesus to show that all of these promises are true and that we can build our lives on Jesus. I pray for moms today in whatever season that You would work in them and through them. I pray for all women, those with broken heart is those whose lives are filled and that you would just un- let them know that you love them so deeply and they are so valuable to you no matter how great their life is or what life has done to them. They are worth far more than a crumpled up $20 bill. They were worth to you the very life of your son. And that's true of all of us, Father. So thank you for loving us and giving us your worth. And I pray this in the name of of the one who is the ultimate worth, the ultimate treasure, your son Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you, Ernie, for that message. I want to remind all of you before we leave today of a couple things. First of all, um, if you would like to respond to this message in any way, um, if, if you are ready to give your life to Christ, or if you're, you need prayers of any kind, or if there's anything you need at all, Uh, The elders have set up this phone number, 864-336-3517, to reach out to them. You can also email them at the new email that's set up, elders at spartanburgchurch.org. Please do that today. Uh, they're, They're looking forward to interacting with you in those ways. Also, I want to remind you of next week coming up, Graduation Sunday, and it starts at 10 a.m. You know, when we meet together, a lot of times we begin at 9.50. We're going to stick to 10 a.m. for our streaming next week. Uh, I do want to also remind you, if you know of any college grads connected to Central, please get that information to me or to somebody on staff uh, early this week so that we can include them in our honoring of the graduates next week. Um, With that said, let's close with our famous song, The Greatest Commands. No!